our VBS, it deals with from Jesus at the moment where he started toting his cross all the way up through the resurrection. Um, it's in the book of John. Let's see. It's John 19, verse 17, through John 20, verse 18. So that's a lot of Scripture. But we're going to focus mainly on the precursor to this, and that will be the book of Isaiah. Jody, if you could pull this up in the NIV version, we'll look at it. It's uh, Isaiah chapter 53. We're going to go verse 5 and then 9 through 11. We're going to start off in Isaiah 53, verse 5. Now, in your uh, in the kids' books, in the kids' lessons, what we're doing is showing them how God told ahead of time what was going to take place. And then you flip over to the book of John and you can see where it happened. So when God says that something is going to happen, you can count on that that God always does what He says He's going to do. And, you know, we can show the kids this. And by this point, and you may have to, if you have some new kids that night, help them to understand what the cross was about. If they hadn't been all week and then they show up on, uh, on Thursday night, we need to make sure they understand what the cross was for. Um, what was the reasoning behind it? God knows with Him being just and holy, that sin cannot exist where He is. You cannot get to where He is with sin. And there has to be a payment for all sin, any sin, from the very first sin in the Garden of Eden to the sins that we have not committed yet. All of these sins cause separation between us and God because where there is sin, God cannot be. He will not be. He, he won't be. So, helping the kids to understand earlier on in the week about what sin is and, and where, um, I guess basically, getting them to see that they are sinners and that you have sin in your heart and that makes you separated from God. So, admitting that you're a sinner is the first step in salvation of as far as the ABCs go, we teach the kids. Now, believing, we understand and we know that that is when you surrender. And as you surrender to the Lord, um, that's when He pays for your sins. Now, on the cross, when He died, that was the payment that satisfied the sin debt. You owed something because of your sins. You owed that... Um, you were going to have to die, which means an eternal death, and that means staying forever in hell. And you would have to do that to pay for your sins, to pay for your wrongdoings. The sins that you go going against what your mom and daddy say, what your teacher says, uh, when you do something and you know it's bad and you know it's wrong, but you do it anyway, you say it anyway, you think it anyway, it's all sin and it causes separation from God. Do you understand what sin is? Do you understand that that makes you a sinner? Well, do you want to pay for it yourself? You don't have to because God loved you so much that He paid it for you. And that's what Jesus went to the cross for. And as Jesus went to the cross, it says here in verse 5, Isaiah 53, 5, He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on Him, and by His wounds we are healed. Isaiah, he was a prophet. God told him some stuff before it happened, so that when it did happen, you could, say, you could see and say, wow, God has already told us about this 400-something years ago. But he's talking about the coming Messiah. He was going to be pierced for our transgressions. He was going to be nailed to the cross. He was going to be crushed by the weight of sin for our, for our sins. All right, It was going to be crushing for him. The, the punishment that would bring us peace, since we don't have to be separated from God forever, it was laid on Him. And by the wounds that He took on the cross, we are healed. So He made a way where we 
could be forgiven. Now, since he paid for it, the only thing left for us to do is just to admit that we need it. Admit that we have sinned and that we are sinners. And accept that gift from God. If you have somebody, um, say like you owe somebody $100, and somebody else comes along and says, I have $100, I would like to pay that for you. All you've got to do is accept it. And if you accept it, then it's paid. You don't owe it anymore. You don't even owe that person because they freely gave it. And that is how salvation works. Jesus paid it so that we wouldn't have to pay it. You can if you want to. God made it where you have the choice. But if you would allow Him to pay for it, He will pay for it. And you will be forgiven of that debt. It will be wiped clean. Now, since Jesus died for our sins, we are healed as the Scripture says. Now, by His wounds we are healed. Now, what that's going to do is it's going to make you feel differently about Him. It should. If you've ever been saved from your sins, it should make you appreciative. It's like somebody paying your debt. It should make you be thankful for that person and always want to to be nice to that person and to honor that person and tell about what that person did for you. And that's what we get to do as Christians. So Isaiah goes on to write, is inspired by the Holy Spirit, down in verse 9. On day 4, we get to talking about the resurrection of Jesus, which is, which is just going to be absolutely something that little kids have probably never heard of before about somebody coming back from the grave. So it talks about in verse 9, He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in His death, though He had done no violence, nor was any deceit in His mouth. So Jesus was assigned a grave with the wicked. He had to die alongside two thieves on the cross. They were getting what they deserved because of their sin, but Jesus had no sin at all. It says there was no deceit in His mouth. There was not a sin at all found in Him. So He was innocent. So He took my guiltiness and your guiltiness. We deserve to hang on the cross just like those other thieves did and what Jesus did for us. He took our spot. And with the rich in His death, He was laid in that tomb and there's a lot of information that the kids are going to learn about how um, this tomb and the whole graveyard system in Israel. Because back then, having a fresh grave dug out of rock, you basically had to chisel a big hole or a room out of rock on the side of a hill. Most times, all they did was find a crack or a little crevice, something big enough where they could put a body in it. And they would place that dead body in it and then just lay, lay a rock up against it so it wouldn't no big animals get in there. And that's really all they did to bury people back then. They didn't have uh, vaults. They didn't have backhoes. They didn't dig too many uh, deep graves. When they did bury somebody underground, it was in sand. So it's, it's, you would have to make a very large diameter hole to keep the sand from just rolling back in there, it would take a long time to dig a hole deep enough and big enough to put a body in it and then to bury it. But that wasn't their custom. They would put it in something hard. That way the body would not be crushed or, or dirtied or anything like that because they would anoint the bodies. They would take and wrap them in cloth and they would put uh, like aloe vera gel and a bunch of different uh, incense spices and stuff like that to make them smell good, they, they believed that that was honoring that, that person. And they would do that. Jesus says here that He would be with the rich in His death. Now Jesus never, even though He owned everything in the universe since He created it, He didn't have a home, He didn't have a house, that it, He used a, a rock for a pillow. So how was He going to afford a tomb. Well, it was a borrowed tomb. And he used a borrowed tomb because he, he wasn't going to have to use it long. 
you know. Um, he knew that uh, when Joseph got ready to be buried, it would be empty. So, you know, having an empty one, uh, having a borrowed one, no big deal. But Joseph was a rich man. He was one of the, uh, he was on the Jewish council of the Sadducees along with Nicodemus, and they came and uh, they wrapped Jesus' body and they fixed him up and they placed him in that new tomb. And y'all, having a big giant rock that you could roll in front of it, that was a very expensive item back then. Because that rock, in order to be rolled, it had to be chiseled just so, so that they could roll it. And it had to be picked up by a lot of guys and placed into a chiseled out little section of the rock face so that it could be rolled into place. And then it would be sealed and so forth so that it would be pretty much airtight and wouldn't no varmint be able to get in there. All right? Um... So when the scripture says he was assigned a grave with the wicked, he died with the wicked, but he was buried with the rich. And there was no sin in him at all. Nothing malicious, no deceit, no lies ever came out of his mouth. It says in verse 10, Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. Now, why would it be God's will to crush his son? Well, God's will is that the payment for sin is death, and Jesus wanted to take that so that we didn't have to experience that. There is going to be something that has to die to pay for sin. And God will not accept any type of payment by anything that you can do, like works or trying to to give Him money. None of that works anymore. They used to would accept animals, like the best animal you had, and they would sacrifice those animals once a year. They don't do that anymore. Since Jesus died, God will only accept two methods of payment for sin. It's either the blood of Jesus or it's yours. And one of them has to be paid for our sins. Well, Jesus' blood was so rich, so great, that He paid for the sins of all the world, past, present, and future. And if that blood is applied to that debt, it's paid. So, it was God's will to crush Him and to cause Him to suffer so that we wouldn't have to. God made him, Jesus made himself an offering for sin. But it says he will see his offspring, his family, and his days will be prolonged. His life is not going to end at death. The will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. So there is uh, more to the story than Jesus died on the cross. And you look on down in verse number 11, it said, After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many and he will bear their iniquities. After he has suffered, after the cross, when Jesus Christ said, it is finished, he accomplished what he came here to do. The payment for sin, the way to God was made. So, he will see the light of life, he would get up out of that grave, and he would be satisfied. You know, it's, it's so beautiful of a story that back in those days, 2,000 years ago, women were looked upon as like second-class citizens. Men were always the important people. They were the ones in, in high positions and whatnot. But God always made a way where he would talk to the ones that were overlooked, looked down upon, and he would give them like a a special privilege in things. And one of the first women that got to witness the risen Savior was Mary Magdalene. And it wasn't one of his apostles, one of his close disciples that, that got to see him. It was one of the female disciples. 
one of the, the ladies that had her life changed and had gone from, from Jesus drawing a line in the sand to protect her to, to now she's getting to see him first. When she first saw him, I believe it's in John chapter 20, but when she first went there and, and he was gone and they ran and they told Peter, John, and, and they ran and they got there and they looked in and it said they believed but they still didn't understand. So they went on. And then all of a sudden Jesus appeared to Mary Magdalene. She didn't recognize him at first. She was like, are you the gardener? Are you the one that's taking care of this, this garden area where the tomb is at? And when Jesus spoke to her, she knew who he was. And she knew his voice. And she wanted to hug him. First thing she wanted to do was give him a hug. As you do. You know? I mean, if I finally get to see Jesus with my own eyes, I'm going to want a hug. And I know that, that he ain't worried about no COVID. Right? So I will be able to hug him. And um, he told her, he said, I have not yet ascended. It's, it's not the time for that. And basically, he was just letting her know first before anybody else, I have risen. I'm alive. I have seen the light of life, and now I'm satisfied. And it says, by his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many. He justified her, her faith, helped her to become one of the, I guess, the leading advocates for Christianity during that day. She had a special privilege. She was able to see. And I think it would be great to tell some of these kids. It might inspire them to see, you know, it wasn't some, some high up individual that, that got to see Jesus first. Jesus reaches out to all people, no matter where you come from, no matter what you look like, no matter how low you might think you are. Jesus reaches down to all of us. And He wants everybody to know just how special they are. You are so special to Him that He suffered the cross for you. He went to that grave for you, and He walked up out of that grave because He still wants to know you. And He will still justify people today. He will speak to us. He will talk to us. He will bear our sins. And He will be the one that, that gets on the phone and speaks on our behalf when people call us wanting to put rocks in our yard. I didn't let Him. I got in His way. But He died for that too. And He will keep on bearing our iniquity so that we could live forever. Now this is a, a kind of hard lesson for, for the little ones to grasp, you know. But I know around that age, from I'd say probably 8 to 12, I've seen a lot of kids get it and understand it. And, you know, I was 12 years old when I got saved, but I remember being afraid of hell and and that eternal death. You know, when the preacher preached that stuff, that scared me. And I remember I was like five, six years old then. And, and that's when I first realized that death was, was a real thing. Went to my great-grandma's funeral, and I seen her laying in that box, and there wasn't no movement. And I'm like, well, that's just, okay. And then they closed it and locked it. And we took her to the graveyard and lowered her down in the, in the ground. And that most kids know what that is. They've seen it. And we need, we get to let them know that that's not the end, though. Because Jesus got up out of the grave, we can get up out of that grave. We are going to get up out of that grave. There's going to be a day, the resurrection day, when all the people that believed in Jesus Christ, when you die, your soul goes on to be with them. But on that day, your body's going to come up out of the grave and your soul is going to be reunited with it and we're going to meet Jesus in the air and it's going to be, it's going to be an awesome day. It's going to be a weird day for anybody cutting the grass in the graveyard, but it's going to be an awesome day.
promise you that. I always think about that every time we have a funeral. What if the rapture happens right now? This is going to be a weird funeral. No, but they they going up. They coming up out of the grave before I go up. It's not long, but it's still before. It, it's going to be long enough to be be freaked out. I, I believe. Yeah. All right. I, I thought it was a twinkling of an eye. I don't know. <laughs> Might just faint. It's going to be, I'll probably get bombarded with people be like, I want to be saved. I want to be saved. Well, just get saved then. Could you imagine people coming up to you like so scared of going to hell that they are begging to be saved? Could you imagine that? It's possible, though. People can be saved. I hope that we see some, some kids get saved, some families get saved. I hope so. Let's pray for that. All right. Jesus, I ask you, Lord, that